finally here on the brink of deer season 1986. Heck, all of us would like to get a big buck like this, and I think a lot more people are going to get a deer this year maybe than in any year past. I'm not sure about that. We have more information from our wildlife biologist around the state, Ed Tucker. Wildlife biologist from southern Michigan has been observing the boom of the herd down there. Gary Bouchel from the northern lower peninsula says it's looking good this year. Bob Wood from the UP has some details on a herd where the hunting is going to be tough for going, I think. We're going to get all the details from these experts in just a minute. You stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Last year, opening day, we had our cameras at Tucks Ace Sporting Goods in Houghton Lake where they had the biggest buck pole they've ever had. Gary Bouchel, is it going to be bigger this year? I think it's going to be very comparable. Uh, uh, there's no question we're going to have a good year. And, and depending on the weather, uh, we'll see something similar to this. Now, last year was a record year throughout the state. What about the UP, Bob? Well, I'm afraid hunters up there are going to find a fewer number of deer in the woods, particularly uh, bucks, but the bucks that they see should have better antlers. They should have. They're going to be bigger. They'll be a lar little, older, little older deer. Okay, and the lower, northern lower will be about the same, and what about southern Michigan, Ed Tucker? Well, we had a record year last year, Fred, and uh, we expect uh, at least a, another record or at least a near, at least as good as last year, basically. We've had some real good reports so far. Now, you usually go out on a limb and say it's going to be better. It was and better. better last year. It was better, but it, you don't think it's going to be better this year? Oh, I think it'll, it, last year was a record, and, uh, you know, it'd be nice to say, yeah, we're going to continue to have records every year. It'll come close if it isn't, anyway. The conditions look pretty good, don't they, to all of you now for opening day? Looks like we're going to have snow. You have a lot of snow in the UP. Yes, we will have a lot of snow, it looks like, by Saturday, and it looks like it will be good hunting. Okay, now you mentioned that the bucks are going to be bigger this year, bigger racks. Why is that? We'll have a smaller year and a half age class because we lost so many fawns last fall or last winter. But the the bucks that will be there are of an older age class, and I think that the hunters that see them will see pretty good sized antlers. Well, the the mortality last winter was well, it wasn't disastrous in the UP, but it was pretty heavy, wasn't it? We have some indications that uh, in the center part of our Upper Peninsula, we had does that lost, or at least 25% of the does did not uh, bear fawns. Hmm. So it was a bad winter in the UP, which d contributes to the somewhat decline of, of hunters this year. Here's some tape that we got at Hulbert last year up around Taquaman and Falls in that area, doing some deer feeding in the winter. You can see the deer just can't wait to get some of that supplemental feed. What about the northern lower, Gary? The northern lower, we didn't have nearly the uh, winter severity that they had in the Upper Peninsula, and uh, but we did have pockets of, of uh, where we had severe winter and it had an impact on the deer. And of course, farther south, you went down towards uh, the Clare area, uh, those conditions uh, disappeared. Mm -hmm. But there, has there ever been any significant mortality in southern Michigan, Ed? Not significant, but we have had occasions in the past where some real rough winters where we had actually lost some fawns around the Fort Custer area and the District 12 in that particular area. And but not last year? Oh, no, not last year. No. So last year, the winter severity that you're looking at right here with the hungry deer flocking in for the supplemental feed was basically the Upper Peninsula up in Bob Woods country. That is, is the main thing that has a significant impact on the lower deer population this year? I believe so, particularly the north half of Region 1, the Lake Superior watershed, certainly had some impact. We had some areas uh, where standing corn, where the farmers could not get mm -hmm. their corn off, and those pockets will certainly have good reproduction, and hunters will see localized conditions of good numbers of deer. Now, that standing corn that we still have in a lot of the fields, isn't that something that's going to be feeding the deer and even contributing more to the population next year? Because it's going to be in the fields? Uh, down south it will be, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that this year in some of the early reports on for some of the uh, counties that had corn that was left over during mm -hmm. the winter. Yeah. What about the agriculture in the northern lower? Is there same, right? same thing happened there, Fred. Uh, last year the farmers had a difficult time getting the crops out of the field and uh, quite a few deer wintered in, t in them. And again, we're, we're experiencing much of the same thing because of the heavy rains this fall. Mm -hmm. uh, the recent uh, periods of, of no rain 
Uh, the farmers are working very hard to get their crops out, but there's still a lot of standing corn out there. In the UP, uh, the southern part of the UP, in that farm country, they, have they, they had the same problem up there? Yes, or? yes they have. Hmm. Now that, Bob, <coughs> when we look at this little fawn here, this is a tape that we took a couple years ago of, a, of an abandoned, an actual orphaned fawn because its mother was hit by a car. But this mortality at this age was, was significant up in the UP. This is where most of the deer die, isn't it not? At this age right here? Or maybe even before they get to that? Yes, I would say perhaps even before. I would suspect the first 24 hours of a fawn's life, if it is born alive, is the critical, critical time. And then, of course, the following next critical time is when that fawn has to make it through winter. Mm -hmm. But the fawn drop last year obviously had to be excellent in southern Michigan. Pretty excellent in the northern lower? Good, except for, again, those pockets where we had severe winter. And in the UP, I read some statistics, I think, where in some areas it was how much? What was the fawn mortality? Well, there were places where it was 25%. And, of course, again, we we're looking at 25% of the does, breeding age does, did not mm -hmm. bear fawns. So. Particularly in the north half, we'll, we'll see the impact of that. The hunters will see that impact out in the woods. So when the hunters don't take enough deer, like if the conditions for some reason are bad this season and don't take enough deer and the starvation doesn't get the deer, this is the next stage, the fawns, where they're hit pretty hard. Well, there's that big boy up at the Houghton Lake Deer Research Station, that wreck. That's what turns the hunters on. What about the UP? You predict we're going to have any of the record book racks up there? It sounds like it. Oh, yes, I believe. Upper Peninsula is, is a standby for large bucks. I guess I'd have to call it a draw between the farm country of Menominee County and Iron Berg uh, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Schoolcraft counties. I but we're, you're looking for some big bucks this year oh, from yes. the UP. Oh, yes. Northern Lower, ah, we never get any real big ones from up there, Gary. Just the occasional big buck, but in exchange for that, the, uh, the hunters are going to see a lot of bucks. Uh, last year's harvest of 79,000 bucks is very significant and brought a lot of uh, outdoor enjoyment to, to mm -hmm. our hunters. And of course, Ed Tucker knows what we have coming up in just a couple minutes. We have a buck that blows the rest of them out of the record book, and it happened to come from Jackson County. That's a good share of the big deer do, friend. <laughs> that's a good share. You never fail to work that in, and that's true, that that's where the big racks are generally coming from. All in all, it looks like a, a real good deer season. The only problem spot might be in the UP, but that's going to be counterbalanced by some big bucks? Definitely. Already, the corn country takes it. A southern Michigan buck right here you're seeing first on Michigan Outdoors that is a record book buck. Craig Calderon from Jackson, mm -hmm. tell me about it. Uh, this, this is going to be the new state record. Uh, I'm pretty sure he scores 192 and a half. The old gun record is 186 and uh, one eighth, and the bow and arrow record is 181. Wow. This is an, uh, the unfortunate, well, not unfortunate, what am I talking about? The deductions that Pope and Young have in the scoring system are for lack of symmetry, and this tying right here does not have a match on this side of the antler, which makes it an uneven number of points here. So that amount is deducted from your score. Yeah, that cost me actually 10 inches because you don't add this side and you subtract it. So it's about a 10 inch difference. So if you happen to have this on this side and you didn't have this little sticker point right here, yeah, this is close to a world record. This little point right here, if it didn't have it, interestingly enough, it would be right snugging up right against up the there. world record. Depends on how much he dries and stuff, because it takes 60 days before you can get him officially scored again. Well, I can score it right now. It has about uh, 16, maybe 17 points. There's some places we can hang some rings on no, this. No, those aren't you need an inch it like, long. Those aren't an inch long. Yeah, so they but don't, they don't you need more points like you need a hole in the head for this. <laughs> this is great. Tell me just a little bit about the story. I know you're, you have it right now, a closely guarded secret. Uh -huh. But we know it's Jackson County. Mm -hmm. Jackson County. Uh, by, by a cornfield? No, actually, a couple of miles from a cornfield. Oh, okay. But what he was doing, he was, he was after a doe. He's about 20 minutes behind a doe. I was up in a tree stand about 25 feet in the air, and uh, he came about 18 yards, and he was broadside of me, and he came a little bit, and, and there was a fresh scrape there. That's part mm -hmm. of the reason that I, I was hunting that area, and he came to the fresh scrape, and I shot him at 18 yards, and uh, wow, he, went, he went 200 yards away, and when I finally came up to him, about 50 yards, I could see him in the opening. Oh, and yeah. if I can show you what I saw, I saw him laying like this right here on the side. With those antlers stacking up about two feet high. Yeah. What is, what's the spread on that? Well, it's 20, almost 25 on the outside and 22 wow. and a half in the inside spread. And this is the broadside shot that I, when I was coming broadside, he was just like this. And that's the, oh, that's what you looked at. That's the side I saw when I shot him. And I just, I didn't look too hard at his horns. I was trying to concentrate on, a, <laughs> oh. on his lungs. 
Wow, well, you made a good shot. You've done your homework. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll tell us maybe a little bit more about this on Big Buck Night, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Craig Calderon Thank already you, may have the Farm Country Buck that is undoubtedly going to be the new state record. You made history before we got to the gun season yet. Well, maybe someone will beat it. I don't know. <laughs> now, let's see what Bob Garner has in store here for deer season and his outdoor headlines. At least one hot, controversial bill sure to come before the legislature next session will be a bill to preempt local units of government from making their own gun laws if they're different than the state. Now, at least one powerful legislator, uh, Tom Scott out of Burden, believes that cities, counties, and townships ought not to be making their own gun laws. Uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, I really believe that that's a state function. I do not believe that uh, that's a local unit function. I would certainly support banning uh, municipalities from uh, making those type of laws. I don't think there's any logic to the, to the fact that one municipality uh, allows handguns, the next municipality, which may be right next door to it, um, does not allow it. How is the individual possibly going to understand uh, what, when, and what to obey. I think it's too confusing. I think that we do need to look at that on the state level, and if anything's to be done, should in fact be done statewide. The judges up north are continuing to pass out huge fines and plenty of jail time to poachers. Reports from the northern part of the state include higher fines than we could have even imagined just a few short months ago. A clarion man, for instance, was ticketed for illegal possession of a deer and paid fines, costs, and restitution of $1,258 in the Charlevoix District Court. The court sentenced him to five days in jail and a loss of his hunting license for 1986, 87, 88, and 89. A father and two sons pled guilty to a charge of illegal possession of a deer in Ross Common District Court. They were sentenced to pay $2,224 in fines, costs, and restitution. They'll also spend five days in the slammer together and lose their guns forever. They will also not be eligible to hunt until 1990. Now, those sentences sound pretty tough, but two poachers from Romeo and Troy really found out the hard way just how tough these new laws really are. They were convicted of illegal possession of seven turkeys and one deer. The judge in Alpena District Court gave them 10 days jail time each, fined them a total of $2,000, and get this, ordered them to pay $1,000 restitution for the deer in each of the seven turkeys. That comes to a total of $10,000 fines, costs, and restitution. The restitution money all goes back to the uh, Fish and Game Fund, the same fund which our license money goes to. The final numbers for the 1985 gun deer harvest were just compiled from the DNR's postcard survey. Originally, the department thought from the 1985 preliminary surveys that the gun deer take was about 160,000, making 1985 the second best deer season on record. But when the postcard surveys were completed, it showed that 186,000 deer were tagged by gun hunters last year, bringing the total deer take with bows, guns, and muzzleloaders to around 230,000, or close to 20,000 more deer than were taken in the record year of 1981. And take a look at this monster buck being held by Sault Ste. Marie taxidermist Randy DeZormo. It won't be claimed by any hunter because it was on the receiving end of a car accident. It wasn't even claimed by a motorist, so the DNR in the Sioux tapped DeZormo to mount it. DeZormo says that it will score in the top five deer heads ever in Michigan, and that it green scored 186 and 6 eighths points on the Boone and Crockett measuring system. A reminder for you handgun hunters, I'm going to be hunting with a handgun. I have the proper registration papers for it in my own name. Remember, you cannot borrow someone else's handgun unless they're with you at the time. So be careful and keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Good advice. Something else, too. When you get a buck, be sure and stop by a DNR field office or district office and have it checked, or at a deer check station on I-75 at Clio, US-27 at Alma, or M-37 at White Cloud. And I'm sure you'll eat well deer season. <laughs> what do deer eat at this time of year? Well, that's a question in our outdoor quiz. Acorns contain protein, fat, and other elements important to the diet of wildlife. In a good acorn year, what percent of a whitetail's fall diet will consist of acorns? Oak trees have been known to produce eight pounds of acorns per acre one year, followed by 528 pounds per acre the next. In a productive autumn, the local deer will eat 80% acorns, which is why oak ridges are often good hunting areas. 
Our Outdoors Forever slogan is making the outdoors accessible to all. Well, big question that we have is what do handicappers find off limits and what do a lot of people who have difficulty outdoors and are going to have difficulty this deer season, what are the problems they encounter? You know, we know that, that a lot of deer hunters won't be hunting this fall because it's just plain too difficult. Maybe they're older, they've had an accident. Catherine Mulhaupt, you're the one who put together this Outdoors Forever magazine. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Outdoors Forever Thank staff. You. She's the administrative director and she's come up with a survey that's in this publication, which by the way will be mailed out tomorrow to all of our Outdoors Club members and, and we'll send a copy to anybody who's interested. But the survey that you're doing right off the bat here is to find out what? We're trying to find out just what it is that people want to do that they're not able to do, whether it's because of their own physical limitations or the limitations that the rest of the society has imposed on them. Okay, well, in the outdoors, when we say outdoors and outdoors forever, we're talking about three things basically. That's hunting, fishing, and the shooting sports. These are the three areas that most of our questions in this survey relate to. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things that we want to find out after some basic data is the, the difficulties that people encounter. Right. right? The specific disabilities, whether it's um, their own injury or it's just the problems that they've faced with obstacles outdoors. And those outdoor obstacles are something that, uh, that we want to find out about. And of course, the activities are the, that are the most important are ones that you think that you will never do again. And this is addressed to the handicapped people or older people who have said, forget it, I can't go deer hunting anymore, it's too tough. There may be types of fishing or camping. We want them activities. to dream. We want them to say, what is it that I had totally given up on? It isn't necessarily impossible. We don't want them to write it off before they've tried. And the physical obstacles, uh, whether it's having to do with boats or maybe access to an area. There's also laws, regulations. For example, with uh, some of the all-terrain vehicles would solve problems for certain handicappers. Right, but there are still some, some limitations on usage. Then we have uh, equipment and techniques, which is something we're interested in finding out about. This is not organized. That's the purpose of Outdoor Forever, Outdoors Forever to pull this together, but equipment and techniques. Also, people know about other handicapper organizations. Right, and we'd like to be in contact with them. Also, we want to know about successes. Right. We want to be able to make people aware that other people are solving their problems. Other people are finding answers. Keep a paraplegic keeps right on paddling, and we want to help all of you folks. See, we're talking when we talk handicaps. We're not talking just wheelchair type no. of handicaps. Anything, anything that you feel is limiting something that you've always done or always wanted to do, you should be able to dream about overcoming that challenge. It can be heart conditions, stroke, it can be arthritis. If you are interested, if you are finding that there's some outdoor activities that you are getting out of, please write to us here. Our address will be coming up right at the end of the recipe. We'll send you a copy of this new Outdoors Forever magazine edited by Catherine, and we're going to hear a lot more about this in the future. Now, deer season dominates. Here we have an interesting recipe that isn't just interesting, but it's a winner in our venison division of our wild game cooking contest. Wes Googler contributed this recipe. He's from Drayton Plains. It's called Grilled Marinated Venison Chops. It has some things on top here that look like pine needles. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it look like an outdoorsy <laughs> recipe. It was a winner. Oh, it sure was. And here we are on the brink of deer season. Uh, neither you, Bob, me, Kathy, no. nor your husband, Bob no. Beitler, have gotten deer. Going to so, change real shortly. So we, <laughs> we did this with, with some elk that your husband got a year ago. A year ago. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at what's in it. There's something that I thought we could taste, which was a garlic. And you garlic cannot clove. taste it. I, I, it must, must be in there somewhere. Onions. Onions. There's quite a stack of onions. Right. And pepper. pepper. And burgundy wine. Not, a, not just a red sweet wine, but actually a burgundy wine, which is quite heavy. You're going to use a lot of it. Going to use um, well almost a whole bottle actually. Well, you're going to use enough to cover. You want to marinate the, completely, mm -hmm. cover your pieces of meat, right? Now we, you know, we don't do very many marinade recipes with wine. Not with wine, no, we don't. We're going to slice this rather than crushing your garlic because we want to be able to see the pieces and maybe pick them out. <laughs> so you don't run into one of those. <laughs> That's right. Going to use cracked <laughs> pepper here instead of just. Regular pepper. Well, Wes is quite an expert. Oh, he was. In his cookery. He was fantastic. He really was. And he says you just have to use the cracked pepper. Now, we've gotten some requests on how much to use for amounts. And um, all I can say is just, you know, just Do, roll with yeah. it. Wes just, says just mix them together. Yep, and I can understand why. They're those pine needles. Yeah, rosemary. And it's actually an herb, and it comes from a small shrub is what it comes from. 
And uh, they're tiny, tiny like leaves. Sage. I yep. picked a couple That's off of the top. Probably and it the like same sage. type of shrub. Gonna, now you're going to heat your marinade up and then let it cool back down just so all the flavors go all the way through your wine. Here is the key to venison elk. And this elk has been in the freezer for a year. Mm -hmm. It was done by a butcher out west who did a lousy job <laughs> yes, he most of trimming. Did. So you, Kath, went ahead and trimmed it, which is, I just can't emphasize how important oh, this is. Oh, I'd much rather throw that away than ruin the meat. That, that boneless meat without any of the white connective tissue or fat, that stuff there. That's a scrap pile. <laughs> if you throw that in with burger, oh, it'll yeah. make the burger taste bad. It sure does. So we yep. trim it. Yep. Now there's the mm. marinade heated up. You're just going to kind of pour it over. And like I say, you do want your pieces completely covered. And this is what we end up with after it's on the grill. You can barely see the little grill marks there, but this was on an outdoor grill. Yes, it most certainly was. And Bob Garner is all mm. done with this. <laughs> Let's see, you said, Bob, at our Wild Game Cooking Contest, you said, I couldn't do any better, I'd eat this seven days a week. <laughs> eight. Eight, eight days, days a week. <laughs> well, it has kind of a, a fruity flavor to it uh, because wine. of the wine. Mm -hmm. You do notice that. I it's kind of neat. Yeah, I, I don't like a lot of recipes with wine, like ducks, mm -hmm. and you know, where they mm -hmm. soak it and totally change mm -hmm. the flavor. But this is pretty good. Look at this right here. The way you cook this, Kathy, is to perfection. It's just a little bit pink in the middle. Oh, mm. yeah, you wouldn't want this completely done. Oh, boy, I tell you. Well, Wes Googler, you have a winner of a recipe here. I'm going to contribute this to Bob. Hey, hey what a good guy I hey, am. Thanks, Freddie. I appreciate it. <laughs> this is in our Wild Game Cookbook, and it was an award winner. And maybe you can enter some of your favorite recipes, too. We'll have information on that in the future. But get outdoors this weekend. Of course, get outdoors. It's oh. deer season. Good luck. Have a safe season, and we'll see you here next week. The opener this weekend looks better than ever, maybe the best in history. I want to wish you all good luck, but also please be safe. Keep your muzzles pointed in the right direction, and don't mix your partying with your hunting. Wait till the guns are put away. Bob Garner is going to be hunting in Misaki County. Kathy Beitler is going to be in Eaton County, and I'm going to be in Clare County. Hopefully, we'll all get our bucks. Bob Garner and I will be visiting Houghton Lake on Saturday night at Tuck's Buck Pole at Tuck's Ace Hardware on M55. Join us with your deer, or just come out to see all the big bucks. It's going to be a good time. Bag a big one and be with us next week for our report on Deer Season 1986.